Hey everyone, it's Luthien, and along with Emrys, we are Girls with Sabres. This video is our collaboration with the ladies of Pop DNA Podcast, where Emrys, along with Rhonda and Erin, discuss Jane Austen's sense and sensibility, and the importance of balance between intellect and emotion in matters of romance. During the podcast, we had some fun, where we audio reenacted scenes from the 1995 film adaptation. The cast includes myself, Luthien, as Eleanor Dashwood, Rhonda as Marianne Dashwood, Aaron as Lucy Steele, Emrys as The Maid, Jared from the Nerd Academy podcast as Edward Ferrers, and introducing my husband, Baron, as Colonel Brandon. For those who aren't familiar, Baron and Luthien were lovers in J.R.R. Tolkien land, best known from his work The Silmarillion, and most recently they got their own standalone story. Since my nom de plume is Luthien, it only made sense to name my husband Baron. Not that I don't like his real name, because I do, and his hair and his hugs. Okay, don't forget to like, comment, share, and subscribe. Enjoy. Hello, friends. Today we have two very special guests. We have the ladies of Pop DNA podcast. Ladies, would you please introduce yourselves to our listeners? Hello. Oh, should I go first? <laughs> Hello, friends. Yeah. Um, I am Rhonda. I am one half of Pop DNA. And I'm Erin. I'm the other half of Pop DNA. <laughs> and um, should we uh, say like what our show is about? Is that what you're? Okay. Sure. Um, so we uh, we like to trace the literary and historical roots of pop culture and media um or sometimes we go like the other way we go backwards um and we also so, really <laughs> like bad jokes like a we lot we do a lot of them <laughs> and they they are numerous <laughs> you are <remarkable. laughs> that's awesome no i love i am a literature person but i have to admit my favorite thing is the humanities because it tells the whole story like it yeah. shows the integration of the history and the art and the society and culture and how the arts really feed and interwine around the people of that time so your podcast is is chef's kiss <laughs> <laughs> thank you thank we you. had fun with it <laughs> yeah we love it it's our it's our baby we love it it's our baby yeah <laughs> Actually, several months ago, uh, yes. we were guests on your podcast where we talked yes, about Star Wars and Myers Briggs slash Kersey. So we thought we would love to have you back and talk about Jane Austen and the Myers Briggs personality and, and how maybe uh, Jane Austen was ahead of her time. What is your favorite adaptation, uh, both of you? What are your favorite adaptations of Sense and Sensibility? I um, love the miniseries. I can't remember yeah. the the year of it. I'm it's blanking. It's like um, 2008, I think. Yeah, yeah. Um, Smart and oh, um, Dan Stevens, Matthew mm -hmm. Abbey. Yes. And, yes, and with Hattie Morahan as Eleanor, I just thought she she's fantastic. Her performance really just blew good. me away. I just was so inspired by her. I mean, the whole piece. <laughs> for sure but I think just Hattie Morahan really nailed that character for for me and for how I see her yeah yeah she has such a, a presence of calm about totally her. Yeah. yeah yeah I think I think that I think the miniseries might be my favorite as well I love Emma Thompson and so I love her film of it that she she um, stars as Eleanor and she wrote the screenplay for that one. Um, but I, as much as I do love it, I feel like the miniseries really understands Marianne in a way that the movie doesn't. And I'm very, I feel very protective of Marianne. So, <laughs> <laughs> so um, I think the miniseries really captures her really well. I, I agree. I see that because Kate Winslet played her more to the extreme um, right. 
than than Sarah Smart did. I believe that's the actress who plays Marianne in the miniseries. So I definitely think you you have a point there. I think let's let's dive into what sense and sensibility is. Let's um kind of set the definition terms of what we mean by sense and sensibility. The definition is according to sense, and this is just dictionary.com. It's a faculty by which the body perceives an eternal stimulus, one of the f- facilities of sight, smell, hearing, taste, and touch. It also is a feeling that something is the case, like mm-hmm. a strong intuition. Mm-hmm. Um, and it is perceived by sense or senses when it's in the function of a verb. Mm-hmm. With sensibility, it is the ability to appreciate and respond to complex emotions or aesthetic influence sensitivity or it's a person's delicate sensitivity that makes them readily offended or shocked when i read sense i think of eleanor when i mm-hmm. read ability i think of marianne would the two of you agree with that statement yeah for sure yeah. and that's interesting because i think sensibility isn't a word that we use very often anymore so i think it's really interesting to look into yeah. what it meant like historically so that's totally yeah mm-hmm. I think in in these days and we'll talk more about how the society saw Mary Ann but I think especially in these days we see Mary the Mary Ann is more of the person that needed to be squashed down <laughs> <laughs> right sense like you're too flighty squash your enthusiasm down I think that's getting better in society but still culture I think we we tend to respect the Eleanors of this world more than the impulsive Mm -hmm. (laughs) Marianne's right instead of like listening to Marianne equally yeah 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 we have more respect for Eleanors and then we just kind of use the Marianne's for poetry (laughs) right (laughs) Write some poetry, then be quiet. <laughs> yeah, exactly. exactly. Where, you know, I think, uh, again, Jane Austen was saying both of these, both of these personalities need to be valued. It's not mm-hmm. sense, but, you know, not sensibility. It's sense and sensibility. And I just, yeah. I love that. I think it's just the, this, this kind of dichotomy that the world has chosen for women too like you're either right. one or the other you can't yeah. be both and you like we're gonna label women this way we're gonna I mean we do this dichotomy we find this dichotomy out of so many places but I think this is definitely one of them as well like is she smart or does she have emotions it's not both ever right yes. yeah and I think um so I earlier today I was uh reading my paperback copy of, of Sense and Sensibility, um, just reading the introduction. Um, and it it was interesting because like it was talking about this idea of like the dichotomy of sense and sensibility, but it points out that at least in like the 18th century view, um, sensibility was like the ability to have empathy and mm-hmm. sympathy for other people, um, which I think is something that kind of gets you know like like you were talking about earlier like when you're trying to squash sensibility in people you kind of lose that ability as well um Mm -hmm. so I think that's an interesting um thing to point out yeah yeah Yeah. going on into the Myers-Briggs Hersey uh understanding and just for new listeners um Kersey is a student of Myers-Briggs, so they have a little bit of a, a different um, perspective of that. Kersey looks more at the um, function of whether you're intuitive or a sensor, because he believed that's how you related to the world and the people around you, where Myers-Briggs are more about how the letters combined together, um, Mm -hmm. which I think is really interesting. But I think if you're a Myers-Briggs person or a Kersey function person, I think you would both see Eleanor as an ISTJ and Marianne as an ENFP. Would you guys agree Mm -hmm. with that assessment? 
Yeah, I think that sounds about right. Yeah, absolutely. So Eleanor is a sensor. So again, she's a sensory person. She she sees the world with a touch feel thinker, but she's also a thinker, a judger. And since she's uh, into uh, introverted, she sees, she thinks, and he she judges the world internally. Where Marianne is very intuitive. She feels highly emotional. She's a perceiver. She's she's more impulsive, and she's an extroverted. So her <laughs> ways that she expresses <laughs> is right out there. And, and you see that. Like I think that's something that Kate Winslet does to the extreme. But mm-hmm. you. See, but like you can tell that the more that she absorbs in the world, the more it energizes her. Yeah. Where if you're an introvert, that more that that kind of energy taking would just be exhausting. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> Let me tell you. Yeah, no, I agree with that. <laughs> yeah. And, yeah, and, and I think we see that. I think we do see that with Marianne because I think she she has times when she needs to like get away from people. But I think most of the time she, we do see her becoming more like she's more in her element when she's around other people and kind of um, interacting with, um, with people. So I think, yeah, she's more of an extrovert. And I think she also wants for people to feel the same feelings that she has. Like yes, she, absolutely. Right. <laughs> she, wants everyone to be energized yeah with with her um right like she doesn't understand why Edward can't read this dramatic reading with feeling and gusto (laughs) she's like why can't you be like me Edward (laughs) basically (laughs) she feels his disdain (laughs) yes (laughs) yeah yeah I, I love how Colonel Brandon, and we'll discuss this a little bit, but I love how <laughs> I think Colonel Brandon is probably an introverted and very much more like the male version of Eleanor, but mm-hmm. how he values Marianne's mm-hmm. action and, and uh, naivete, and he does not want to squash her like a bug. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. <laughs> and he balances her out. Yeah. Right. See. I just think you're so right that <laughs> like Jane Austen was so before you know like this mm-hmm. discussion is just fascinating right like the fashion or the discussion around extrovert like taking great joy in being around people versus introvert needing your time to have some space I think that that's mm-hmm. just such a fascinating conversation and I it's what makes me love this story is that it talks about those things and kind of how we relate to each other. And like we were saying, like you were saying with um, Colonel Brandon, how he sees those things in Marianne and almost wishes he could be that way. You know, he Mm. wishes like, I wish that I could express myself this fully. And I wonder also if Marianne would ever like, want some of his qualities as well so Mm -hmm. I I don't know I just think that's such an interesting discussion of relationship in general well and we do see like toward the end of the book when Marianne is talking to Eleanor and she kind of like we see that she's starting to kind of develop at least like an appreciation for those qualities that Eleanor has where she's able to kind of regulate her Um, emotions and kind of regulate what she shows to the outside world and that's what Marianne um, is is kind of like hoping that she'll be able to learn from Eleanor Um, so I do think that that both of them um, like both of them do learn from the other and I think that I, I feel kind of bad because I I feel like we're talking so much about Marianne and yeah. like, um, <laughs> but I think Eleanor you know this is probably true of of many people who have that same kind of personality as Eleanor that like it appears that they don't have strong emotions that they don't really care about things but of course as we find out that's not true for Eleanor like she. Yeah 
yeah. feels her emotions very deeply. Right. She just doesn't express them, um, you know, very like publicly or, or even to her own family. Um, you know, she's kind of, <laughs> she's, uh, she's, I, I like to say that, that the Dashwood sisters are a lot like Elsa and Anna from Frozen. Right. Because, <laughs> um, because uh, Eleanor is like Elsa, you know, she, she said she's like conceal don't feel um like don't let your um uh, your emotions take control of you like keep them under wraps so that you know no one can tell what you're feeling um and then of course Marianne's the opposite um like Anna so um yeah but I think that that's important to note about that ISTJ personality is that it's not that they don't feel anything. It's that they they take those emotions um, under, you know, they examine those emotions and um, kind of try to control them so that they don't act irrationally. Um, I think that's um, what we see with Eleanor for sure. Yeah. And that like this kind of, I mean, maybe in some um, portrayals of Eleanor, it's almost like a fear of showing too much. Right. Of showing, yeah. I felt this really huge thing, and I don't want anyone to know I felt it. It's for me, but it was huge, and I'm still kind of processing it. Mm-hmm. So I can't really let people in on that right now. But gosh, is it a lot for me right now <laughs> to... to <laughs> to reconcile with in my bed at night when I'm having those before um, falling asleep thoughts or whenever you process or when you, you know, hit a carpet in the middle of your yard um, because you can't, (laughs) you can't unleash those emotions um, for fear of what people will say. And then handsome. Or just for, or even just for fear of like overburdening the people around you. I think for Eleanor, that's what it is, is that she doesn't want to, um, you know, because especially when we first see her, like her, her family is, you know, going through a really hard time. And so she yeah. doesn't want to add to Marianne's distress or her mother's distress by, you know, unloading these emotions on them. And so she keeps it to herself. Totally. Percy calls SJ people, censor judges, the guardians. And I mm. think that's perfect description of Eleanor is she's a guardian not only of herself but her entire family she's the one that looks at the budget she's the one that (laughs) yeah her that her mother okay that her younger sister Margaret is okay like she's the one really nurturing right yeah way um and she's the one also trying to guard her sister against Willoughby. Eleanor sees that Willoughby is moving too quickly towards mm-hmm. Mary Ann is moving too quickly towards Willoughby. And she sees warning flags where her sister could get hurt by this man. Um, so, like, she really is a guardian of not only herself, but everyone that she comes in contact with, even Lucy Steele in the mm-hmm. 95, I think it's 95 Ang Lee version is like she, although that woman has hurt her deeply unbeknownst to her, mm-hmm. <laughs> it still guards Lucy's secret. Yeah. Right? You know, yeah. she is, yeah, has that integrity about her. And, and I, like you said, I love, I, th- I can't remember her name in the mini series, but um, one thing that I noticed that I didn't wa- didn't notice a couple of times previously that I've watched it is Hattie. I think her name is Hattie, right? Yeah. Um, Hattie Morahan. Yeah. Yeah. I think she gives such a sensitivity to Eleanor. Mm-hmm. Yeah. She doesn't express it verbally or have these heightened emotional outbursts like Marianne does you can see it in her eyes totally yes totally Um, her eyes are so emotive and really communicate uh what she is feeling and thinking on the inside well I think 
but there were only two times where Emma Thompson's Eleanor just burst up the seams. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, I really, I really appreciate both actors. <laughs> yeah, I liked um, when uh, uh, Aaron and I were like texting about it um, before, and I was like, Eleanor is like an emotional sham wow. Like <laughs> she just like absorbs everyone else's problems and emotions and just keeps it inside like she doesn't let anything out right Uh, (laughs) yeah and and she's also more of the logical you know person like Mm Mary if you behave like this especially in the regency period women who smile too much I, I remember reading um what uh, Charles Dickens ate and what Jane Austen knew. If you haven't read oh, that. Yeah. I love that book. <laughs> it's amazing. But I remember reading like um, women were instructed not to smile too much or laugh too mm-hmm. much because it was a uh, expression of flirtation and mm-hmm. onto someone. And if you flirted too much with one man, then you were considered a loose woman. <laughs> <laughs> and wrong impression I would not make it during the regency like, <laughs> some sort of vicious trollop or something <laughs> <laughs> I bet so you can just see Eleanor's fear of what would become if Marianne continues in this yeah and if you haven't read listeners go read <laughs> <laughs> it's really eye-opening of how different Jane Austen's uh, world is in the Regency period, Regency period, and and how women were just so confined, men and yeah. women. Yeah. Yeah. Women. yeah, but women especially. I think I I think it's in um in the Emma Thompson version. Um, she has a line where she's. Um, she's talking to Edward and, you know, she's saying that like, you know, you're, you're going to inherit your fortune, but we as women can't even earn our fortune. Like yes. they have absolutely no um, options. And so I think that's a really interesting um, point of similarity between Marianne and, and Eleanor is that they are both in the same situation where they, you know, they basically, they have to get married like that's their only that's their only choice for survival and so they and I think sort of how they deal with that constriction or that confinement is obviously very different but I think that it's coming from um, their lack of balance is coming from that same place of being constricted to this one role that society has given them absolutely yeah yeah i i i think that's why uh jane austen sometimes is not given enough credit Mm -hmm. is she saw what was going on in her own time period and instead of writing essays or lectures of how wrong it is is she she showed how wrong it was and her novelizations by creating Mm -hmm. the theme for these characters absolutely the social politics of that time and seeing what, what happens if the male uh the male uh, can't think of the word sorry inheritor <laughs> yes <laughs> is a um is a greedy man like mr dashwood their right. mm-hmm. stepbrother yeah so it's uh, it's difficult to watch sometimes I think she does along that line. I think she does a really good job of writing the heartbreak of all of that for women. You know, mm-hmm. she really writes like what this feels like to have your entire life upended. And it's so easy for someone else to just walk in and take it all because that's what it was supposed to be. You know, whatever, mm-hmm. this is how it's supposed to be done. So we're doing it. It's proper, but like how just tumultuously like, unsettling and awful that is yeah yeah I remember because I, I watched the mini series today as well <laughs> for the mother you know saying this would never ha- happen to me if I was still the mistress of my own home if I was mm-hmm. 
uh, the lady of, of the house and uh, she couldn't do anything about it. Um, and it kind of plays into why we kind of see this dichotomy between Eleanor and her mother of like she's taking care of her mom too because that's so such a, a change for for mom as well that Eleanor kind of takes the the reins in some senses in that relationship and kind of becomes the protector of her mom um, and we see that reversal a little bit I definitely think Mrs. Dashwood is a lot like Marianne mm-hmm. and yeah. so why Eleanor became the mom instead yeah. of right. <laughs> she likes like mom needs guardianship too. <laughs> so let's let's we we kind of touched about this, but let's go back to um, Eleanor's and Marianne's relationships because mm-hmm. really uh, that is the heart I think of this novel is how how they deal with men (laughs) right right how that really is the crucible that shows what their core is and really um molds them into more mature women eleanor uh has a relationship with a very slippery young man (laughs) 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 paris and edward we learn uh later in the novel is uh, engaged to another woman, and uh, Eleanor keeps these relation, this relationship, this affection, pretty close to her chest. Yeah. Where Marianne meets a man very much like herself, Willoughby, mm-hmm. uh, who is very in touch with his emotions and very impulsive, and they're like, we feel it now, so we're going to act on it now, and mm-hmm. we're going to. Um, expose our hearts to something that we may not be ready for. It reminds me of such a high school relationship. Yes, completely. Yeah. You know? When you when you just said Willoughby, I just involuntarily started shaking my head. I was just like, <laughs> nope, I'm still so mad about it. Yeah. <laughs> Willoughby reminds me of like all the men that broke my heart in high school. Oh, <laughs> right? No. Oh my gosh, I know. I'm right there with you. Yeah. So let's go ahead and analyze some some scenes and from the script. So this scene is in about the first fourth of the movie. Marianne has met Willoughby and they are in a whirlwind romance. She is making quite a spectacle of herself to Eleanor's embarrassment. And this is a scene between Eleanor and Colonel Brandon after they have seen and witnessed Marianne's um, behavior. And Eleanor confides in her embarrassment and her concern with Colonel Brandon. Your sister seems very happy. Yes. Marianne does not approve of hiding her emotions. In fact, her romantic prejudices have the unfortunate tendency to set propriety at naught. She is wholly unspoiled. Rather too unspoiled, in my view. The sooner she becomes acquainted with the ways of the world, the better. I knew a lady like your sister. The same impulsive sweetness of temper, who was forced into, as you put it, a better acquaintance with the world. The result was only ruination and despair. The sooner she becomes acquainted with the ways of the world, the better. Wow. Uh, and there, I think we're seeing the error, the error of Eleanor. Yeah, that's so perfectly yeah. summed up in that sentence. Yeah. What he's, what she's basically saying is, as the judger. <laughs> uh, <laughs> way is it's time for Marianne to see the consequences of her action right Right. there's the guardian and what does a guardian like to do judge and punish (laughs) the crime how do you both interpret that passage yeah I think that's this is also a place where we see kind of Eleanor's um fear for her sister um Mm -hmm. yeah 
I'm thinking about this, the, the specific, um, the ways of the world, like we, can, what are we going to do to change them? She has to learn that this is how other people behave in this world. And I'm like, I, I think we see her just being fearful for what will happen to her sister as well. If she, and it, it's like, it also makes me think that Eleanor doesn't necessarily like living this way but it is it she feels that this is what she has to do this is her lot right. this is absolutely yeah yeah this scene remind i i totally agree with with everything Aaron said um but i was also thinking this scene reminds me a lot of the scene in Emma where Mr. Knightley and Mrs. Weston are talking about Emma And Mr. Knightley says uh, something to the effect of, you know, I think that that um, it would do Emma good to um, to fall in love and not have that love returned. So he's he kind of like Eleanor, he's he is kind of looking out um, looking out for Emma, but also wanting her to learn, um, you know, how to navigate in the world. And that's kind of what Eleanor is hoping for Marianne, that she thinks that if Marianne is able to um, kind of rein in her emotions more, she'll have more success navigating the world. Um, And that, that just struck me as kind of a very similar uh, scene because it's two people talking about um, a young woman who who and and disagreeing about what the best course for that young woman is to you know be successful in in that society. So just an interesting parallel, I thought. Yeah, absolutely. I can totally see um, the similarities there for sure. You know, Eleanor. I don't think she's being vicious here. I think right. right. No, I I want you to learn so you you can see things from my point of view and you know me better as well. Yeah. Uh, um and and here is Colonel Brandon's response to that. Uh, Colonel Brandon looks at her sharply and then speaks very deliberately as though controlling some powerful emotions. Again, I think that's the the uh the mature Eleanor um, being a man and seeing uh, what happens when a quote unquote Marianne or Emma does taste the ways of the world and all the consequences and all the hurt. And I think he's warning her, Eleanor, of, of what that does to a person of delicate sensitivities. Because again, the definition of sensi- uh, sensibility as a person's delicate sensitivity that makes them readily offended or shocked. And we see um, Colonel Brandon's charge as well as, um, and, and the fall that she had, as well as when Mary Ann's heart is broken with Willoughby, both of those girls experience just nailed them <laughs> that's the wrong yeah. thing. <laughs> just wounded them almost yeah. um wounded them in a, a in an unmeasurable way like colonel brandon has seen what happens and he's warning eleanor you have no idea mm-hmm. <laughs> you're seeing upon them um and how much you can learn from that kind of heartbreak, like letting yourself go that deeply in love and then get so deeply heartbroken teaches you unique lessons about yourself and about mm-hmm. resilience and all of that and how important those are to forming yourself as a human and for future relationships and that this is, these are important lessons and it's important that you do feel, you know, all of that stuff. Yeah, yeah. Um, Colonel Brandon says, I knew a lady like your sister, the same impulsive sweetness of temper, who was forced into, as you put it, a better acquaintance with the world. The result was only ruination and despair. 
And I apologize, mm-hmm. Alan of the Rickman. I just don't do you justice. <laughs> but um, there, I think that is Colonel Brandon is the the sense person, the one of rationale and judgment, seeing it, sensing that experience, and being a guardian to both Mary Ann and Eleanor because I mm-hmm. really think he wants to protect this family. Um, yeah. Right. And we also see in other um, in other scenes, we see uh, Colonel Brandon's respect for Eleanor, like his respect for her judgment and her um, like her sense of um, of uh, I don't know if propriety is the right word, but like he really respects how um, how logical and how uh, reason like how how well she's able to reason. Um, he trusts her judgment about Edward, kind of sight unseen. Um, so I think that's a really um, this scene kind of establishes that that mutual respect they have for each other. And she he confesses to her what happened to his child. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. That is some pretty heavy information. Totally. Uh, um so yeah <laughs> and Eleanor has to be the emotional sham wow again <laughs> yeah right to everyone I was really you know when I was new to this story I was really wary of um Brandon I was really sure. like I don't know I don't I, I'm protective over Marianne in the same way that I guess everyone is um <laughs> But I, this conversation made me kind of trust in him. And I was like, oh, okay. Okay. So maybe this guy isn't, Yeah, you know. Yeah. You see that he, um, that he, he really sees Marianne. He sees who she really is and he, and he appreciates um, her as she is rather than trying to change her and fit her into this mold like the rest of the world seems to be doing yeah Yeah. and like especially like whoever her suitor was going to be there was that fear that they would do that to her Mm -hmm. you know absolutely Um, yeah yes I read a um analysis of sense and sensibility and again I'll put these links below and I'll share this with you ladies if you would like it but a of woman <laughs> makes a yeah. call of Colonel Brandon and Mary Ann to Ruth and Boaz. In oh, Boston. yeah. I see that. Uh, you no, know, Boaz was this older, richer man, and he saw Ruth, who was living in poverty with her mother in law. And so he made sure that she could gather all the grain that she needed to make bread so they wouldn't starve. And he ended up marrying her and providing for um, the entire family. Mm-hmm. It's, the word for that was kinsman redeemer, meaning yes. the person to provide, the person to take care of, guard, and revenge anyone that would try to hurt uh, these women. And I see Colonel Brandon being that guardian over everyone. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, like he is for all of the Dashwoods and he's for the other women under his protection. Like he, mm-hmm. he's one of those Austin men who really respects the females in his, his life. Mm-hmm. He's pretty that. great. Yeah. <laughs> In fact, in the way I found this article was the scene in, again, I'm going on the Ang Lee trip, but there's a scene in the Ang Lee version where Mary Ann is cutting shards of wheat. We don't know why. Oh, Probably yeah. Decoration or something of that sort. And she can't break it off because it's, uh-huh. too, um, it's too hard. And so she is she's really struggling and we see Colonel Brandon leaning over and handing her his knife. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Um, And then that's the scene. That's Boaz and and Ruth, like gathering, gathering the grains. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. I also love the scene in, in the movie 
um, much later where he's, um, or like after they've come back from uh, London and, or actually, right. So like after Marianne has like recovered from her illness and she's just like chilling outside and he's reading her poetry, I'm like, oh, that's exactly yeah. what, that's exactly what Marianne wants and needs. And he understands that, which yeah. I think, yeah, I think that um, the movie does do a good job with their relationship. Um, I also appreciate it that it's, it's helping her without performatively helping her. Like, right. oh, you need my help. You're such a, you know, whatever you want to say, like, it's not, it's without judgment. It's just, oh, mm-hmm. all humans need help sometimes. Here, take and my without, knife. Yeah. And without his own agenda. Yeah. As well. Like, he's, he's truly helping just because she needs help, not for any other reason. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Nice points, ladies. Very good. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh. Another, the poem that he reads to her at the very end, the scene that you were discussing, um, mm-hmm. he's reading a poem from the Fairy Queen. Um, oh, I've, yeah. And the, the, uh, the line that he reads is, nothing is lost that can't be found. Mm-hmm. And the oh, Fairy oh. Queen is, is, a, is a huge epic poem about purity. Like, that's what the Fairy Queen yeah. Yeah. Sense. And so I think he's saying, like, maybe the Regency period and their really harsh and uh, harmful views of what purity is, well, that's just rubbish. <laughs> you, still <laughs> have your, you still can have your heart. You still can get back some of your sensibility that the ways of the world try to rob from you. I yeah. do. That's funny. We just talked about Edmund Spencer in our last episode. Yeah, we did. We can't seem to, can't seem to get away from that guy. So here's our second scene. This scene is about uh, halfway through the movie. It's between Eleanor, Lucy Still, Mary Ann, Edward, and of course the maid. <laughs> um, this is, takes place after Eleanor finds out that Lucy Still and Edward are secretly engaged. So there's a lot of tension in this scene. Uh, so let's uh, reenact. How is your dear sister, Miss Dashwood? Poor thing, I must say I do not know what I should do if a man treated me with so little respect. I hope you're enjoying your stay with John and Fanny, Miss Steele. I was never so happy in my entire life, Miss Dashwood. I do believe your sister-in-law has taken quite a fancy to me. I had to come and tell you, for you cannot imagine what has happened. No, I cannot. Yesterday, I was introduced to Edward's mother. Indeed. And she was a vast deal, more than civil. I have not yet seen Edward, but now I feel sure to very soon. There's a Mr. Edward Fares to see you, Miss Dashwood. Do ask him to come up. Miss Dashwood, how can I- Mr. Fares, what a pleasure to see you. You know Miss Steele, of course. How do you do, Miss Steele? I am well. Thank you, Mr. Fares. Do sit down, Mr. Fares. You must be surprised to find me here, Mr. Fares. I expect you thought I was at your sister's house. Let me call Marianne, Mr. Ferrers. She would be most disappointed to miss you. Edward, I heard your voice. At last you have found us. Forgive me, Marianne. My visit is shamefully overdue. You are pale. I hope you have not been unwell. Oh, don't think of me. Eleanor is well, you see. That must be enough for both of us. And how do you like London, Marianne? Not at all. The sight of you is all the pleasure it has afforded. Is that not so, Eleanor? Why have you taken so long to come and see us? I have been much engaged elsewhere. Engaged elsewhere? But what was that, when there were such friends to be met? Perhaps, Miss Marianne, you think young men never honor their engagements, little or great. 
No, indeed. For Edward is the most fearful of giving pain, and the most incapable of being selfish, of any one I ever saw. Edward, will you not sit? Eleanor, help me to persuade him. Uh, please forgive me. I, I must take my leave. But you are only just arrived. You must forgive me. I have an urgent commission to attend to for Fanny. In that case, perhaps you might escort me back to your sister's house, Mr. Ferrers. I would be honored. Goodbye, Miss Dashwood. Miss Marianne. Why did you not urge him to stay? He must have had his reasons for going. His reason was no doubt your coldness. If I were Edward, I would assume you did not care for me at all. That is my favorite scene Aww. in the whole thing. I think <laughs> you just see so perfectly how the two women see life differently mm -hmm. and understand kind of the depth of what's happening in a social situation differently. Right. Understand, um, I don't know, I think it also does a really nice job of like, you can see just how taxing kind of you've seen throughout the film or throughout the um the plot how taxing these interactions are for Eleanor and then she's mm. thrust into just such a difficult situation and by the end you can just in um Emma Thompson's performance there you can just see like I need to not be around people for right. like the next month of my life. That was uh -huh. too much. I have, I have felt like a whole gamut of things in the past 10 minutes and I just need to be done. And then <laughs> conversely, you can see just how honest Marianne is, you know, yeah. and, and just how like you feel these things. Why are you not telling him? And she's also, Marianne is also the only one out of all four of those people who has no idea what's really going on, like, beneath the surface. Like, right. why why the other three people in the room are so yeah. <laughs> conflicted. Um, so that's really interesting that she's the one who is, like... Uh, you know, like she is kind of like telling, you know, like you were saying, like she's being very honest and like, why, you know, why isn't everyone just like, you know, being open? Well, it's because they have this deep, dark secret. <laughs> yeah, because there's a lot of other stuff happening, friend. Right. <laughs> I love how she comes in and her eyes are all puffy from crying and she's literally carrying the handkerchief <laughs> in her hand like see everyone I've been crying I mean that's that's how open she is with right. her actions where Eleanor would probably never <laughs> right. come oh. to a yeah. room and show people that she's been crying and oh. with her handkerchief in hand I, it's just and in fact, she's like holding her hands, which is like a nonverbal of confinement of, yeah. of wanting to be found out or seen or um, hiding something. Again, conceal, don't fill. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. And it's just such a masterfully written scene, too. Like every, like all four of those characters, we know as the audience you know, what each of those characters' internal conflict is, but they don't all know each other's internal conflicts. And so seeing their interactions with each other is just so, so interesting. Like, it's just, yeah, I, and, you know, that's the genius of Jane Austen, but also in the movie version, the genius of Emma Thompson, because she wrote the screenplay. Yeah. It's just, yeah, incredible, incredible writing. There's a, a scene where when Marianne finds out about Edward and, and Lucy, she comes over to uh, Eleanor and puts her hands on both of her face and goes, mm -hmm. Eleanor, yeah. where's your heart? Yeah. yeah. Eleanor just loses it and says, mm -hmm. have you no idea how this has been pressing on me? How, you know, I have felt everything. I just haven't communicated it to, to anyone and, and and like we said that is very wise of her because 
this feels like everything that's been in Eleanor's brain, every like worst case scenario that's been in Eleanor's yes, brain absolutely. for the last however many months. Like, oh my goodness, I'm feeling, first of all, oh my goodness, I'm feeling this way. And then, oh my goodness, what if he feels this way back? And then, oh my goodness, he doesn't at all. And I've been thinking this for such a long time that we're reciprocating. And then all of a sudden, that's not true. And then, oh my goodness, what if I'm with them in public together, as I probably will be? And then it all happens. <laughs> Hush. Yeah, it's like each each person who has added to the scene like Eleanor gets more and more uncomfortable yeah (laughs) you can see like she's not super comfortable with Lucy but then Edward comes in and that makes it super awkward and then Marianne comes in and it just blows up (laughs) she's a ticking bomb (laughs) yeah yeah Yeah. she really is of course too Eleanor is probably also considering like I told like the only person who knows about this is the person who's being loudest about my feelings that I would like to be quiet about. Like, I thought it was safe to have this conversation with you. And then it, ah, geez. Okay. Well, (laughs) last time I ever talked to anyone about anything. I do love that scene and um, the mini series where Edward does um, meet them in the cottage and you see him uh, chopping wood and he's all frustrated and he's just yes good like with the angst and the frustration that Eleanor herself is feeling and he mm-hmm. says I shouldn't have come here I really love that the miniseries included that scene yes. because we now know that Edward was feeling the same way and it was concealing the same feelings that he had where I feel like in the movie version um you really didn't know where Edward stood right <laughs> right yeah. yeah awkward because he knew he uh, played with Eleanor's emotions <laughs> is right. he because he's been found out like why is he be it just, is the awkwardness like feelings or is the awkwardness being slippery um mm-hmm. hot so I really love that scene in the miniseries because I thought it showed more integrity yeah mm-hmm. I think that's also the Hugh Grant effect we're like which one are we getting <laughs> are we getting the one we like or are we getting the one who's awful like uh-huh. where are we like his character in Bridget Jones exactly <laughs> yeah. do I have that one or do I have you know somewhere where he was a good person I don't know <laughs> like let's just see what happens is it a Wickham or a Darcy <laughs> yes. do you love it when Eleanor and uh, Marianne after Marianne um, settles down uh, reflects and learns from her lesson and she goes I wish I wish my reaction to Willoughby was your reaction I wish I had I had more sense and you see Eleanor just take that in I love that moment for Marianne because it shows growth and that yeah. it didn't she didn't uh it didn't turn into bitterness and it mm-hmm. turned to transformation yeah and it or um the other way it could have gone is like this in impo- he becomes an impossible paragon in her mind you know like yeah. oh willoughby is the perfect man and i really missed out i really blew mm. it instead it's oh no thank goodness that didn't happen because right. we're done it. <laughs> totally yeah. Um, one thing that I thought was interesting is is Ang Lee and uh, Emma Thompson gave Willoughby and uh, Willoughby. Oh, sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, Colonel Brandon and Marianne, the wedding. No, we didn't get to see Eleanor and um, Edward get married. We saw um, we saw Marianne and Colonel Brandon get married. Mm-hmm. But in the book, we didn't really get that concrete happily ever after just an, an inference um right um jane austen ended it that way instead of a double wedding like she she did in part and prejudice mm-hmm. yeah i put um i put a comment in the outline um i just copied and pasted the passage from the book 
where it's talking about that, um, you know, where it says that um, it was, let's see, I think it's, it even says that it's about two years later that they do end up getting married. Um, but I think if we're wondering why it took, <laughs> I quote unquote, took so long, um, <laughs> like two years isn't really that long um but uh why (laughs) um why they didn't you know get engaged like in you know like sort of on screen I suppose um I think it's because it's showing you know like we were just talking about with Marianne it's showing her growth that she um that she's kind of learned to um, take things a little bit slower. And even though she might have very strong emotions, she can kind of internalize them more and think about them more and really consider how she wants to act on them. Um, And then I think also just, um, you know, I, I love, um, the passage where it says that um, uh, Marianne could never love by halves and her whole heart became in time as much devoted to her husband as it had once been to Willoughby. Oh, um, I love I, that. I, that's my she, favorite line of the whole book that she could never love by halves. And so I think it's also maybe just showing that like time is still like, she still has kind of a wound from yeah. Willoughby. And so, um, she just needs the time to to heal and to get to know herself apart from him so that she then can give her whole heart to Colonel Brandon. Um, and I think that that just, you know, sometimes that just takes time to be able to do that. So I think that shows his depth of understanding of her as well, to be able to mm-hmm. say, I trust you. I believe you that you are truly just healing and that we're also going to have our journey. You know, I think that really shows his ability to see her as fully as she is. And I think that's really beautiful. Yeah. Well, and and it also shows the difference between Willoughby and Phantom because Willoughby, the way that he is, I think he would want Marianne to define herself through him. Right. Right. Yeah. Where... Colonel Brandon wouldn't do that you know it's it's maturation and then marriage which yeah I like that I'm sorry guys it's been so long since I've read it (laughs) I need to go back and and reread it again well Uh, I think I think too it's one of those books that would change as as now we're women you know mm -hmm. it would be a different read it would be yeah yeah We'd probably have different alliances with different characters Uh um, now that we're a little older. Yeah, I think it's actually on my reading list. I want to, yeah. Yeah, Yeah. I remember reading it. I think I, I think I was like 16 or 17 the first time I read it. So I was the same age as Marianne and I, I felt everything she felt. And, you know, now I think the most recent, most recently I reread it, the whole book was maybe about a year ago. And I remember, like, I still really identify strongly with Marianne, but I can appreciate Eleanor's point of view much more now than I could when I was 16. So that was totally. really interesting. It surprised me, Rhonda, when we watched it um, a few weeks ago, that I related so strongly to Eleanor. Mm-hmm. Um, I was like, oh, wow, I, I've grown up a little bit. But not that that's good, but just that that's like a life process I've been right. through to understand Eleanor and kind of see when I was 16, I, you know, Marianne all the way. And now that I'm a little older, somehow Eleanor has also snuck in um, to my thought process. <laughs> right. to You know, she's kind of been, I don't know, the whispered voice of, I don't want to say like... <laughs> Just whatever we become the as we get a The voice of reason. Little... Yeah, the voice <laughs> of reason. But I feel like Marianne is so, like, in her emotiveness is so mm-hmm. reasonable because right. she's, she, she knows. She sees things really clearly. 
and she's she knows it's worth it to give mm-hmm. yourself up fully to something um and yeah, I think so- that's kind of where like like we're talking about how like we identify with Marianne but we also you know feel Eleanor or you know we see Eleanor's view too that's kind of where Marianne ends up by the end of the book like she recognizes yeah Eleanor has a really valuable perspective and I would do well to see her perspective and incorporate some of that into my own perspective so like we're just on Marianne's journey (laughs) all of us together I love it (laughs) Well, and I think it, it goes back to the very beginning of this podcast that it's sense and sensibility. And as we mature, mm-hmm. we're supposed to see Mary Ann and Eleanor right. and yeah. equality in our in our makeup, um, being equal in our in our makeup in the way that we perceive things. Yeah, I love oh, this awesome. story. I'm going to start rereading this like the second we're off this call. I really (laughs) is like, I want to read it really bad right now. Me too. Yeah. (laughs) It's very, I, so like I have kind of been like rereading sections of it to prepare for, for this. And I noticed that it's very, it more than any other Jane Austen novel, it feels more of the 18th century rather than the early 19th century Mm. and I think it's because of that sensibility aspect like it very much um feels like you know like Samuel Richardson or like um uh or like some of the like the late 18th century like gothic novels that were very uh, very much about sensibility um and I think, yeah, in that way, it feels very, I know this sounds like super English majory, but it feels very 18th century to me, oh, more yeah. so than like Pride and Prejudice or Emma, which feel very 19th century. I was reading an interesting article about that, about how scholars have said that Marianne is the incoming of the new way of thinking, and Eleanor represents kind of the old way of thinking mm-hmm. at this Mm -hmm. time when it was written because the world was in between two different um, ways of being and ways of engaging with one another Um, and I just yeah um, what you were just said reminded me of that well it's it's on the outskirts uh, of the age of reason (laughs) yeah (laughs) totally yeah and so then that yeah the age of reason and the romantic era kind of exactly. transitioning in between them yeah um, I'm trying to look I think Sense, Sense and Sensibility was the first of her novel published yeah it was wow yeah. yeah so that makes sense too of why it would have more of a late um, 18th century viewpoint to it as well mm-hmm. yeah yeah so ladies is there any closing statements that you would like to make over sense and sensibility read it (laughs) yeah I just I feel like it's almost a handbook for growing up as a woman you know Mm kind of like a like a handbook for um just different ways of perceiving the world and different ways of perceiving those around you and how to navigate all the things we're supposed to be as women now still, but also certainly more so back then. Um, Yeah. Yeah. I think it's something that I I would say is really required reading for, and you know, not even just women, everyone, like it's a really important way. Men should read Jane Austen. Oh, yes. And like, (laughs) I think as you grow up and as you get into your first romantic relationships or personal relationships or, you know, whatever, um, this is a really important book to read as you navigate those first choices that you make within your relationships with people and judgments that you make. Um, And yeah, I I think it's really important reading for anyone who is a growing human. (laughs) Yes, yes. Well, yeah, I just thought about for Eleanor um, because of Ray's cycle. I've really become like a great 
or a defender <laughs> for the heroin cycle. <laughs> it's like yeah. Cycle and and men need to really study and learn from the heroin cycle because it would just help in seeing the world from a female's perspective, and so it mm-hmm. helps with your interaction with women in your day to day life. It's like this is how some of the women that I interact with feel and think and and their stories. Um, I just thought, I wonder if one of the reasons Eleanor locked herself away is seeing how her mother responded and acted and being embarrassed. Oh, that. Yeah, and that could be. Eleanor's ability to open her heart up again was her way of healing the mother within her. I love that. Yeah, that's yeah. beautiful. And from her that huge feeling of embarrassment for their whole family as thing as as the novel starts you know and like how to preserve their family yeah because that's what women do when they're gardening gardening is I have to be both mother and father because my mother can't do it she's not capable of rational rational so I've got to take off the feelings of, of romanticism and idealism because no one in my family is doing that. So I need to take on the more quote unquote masculine clothes, be the provider, be the guardian and be the, you know, the man in the family. And so that was shedding, shedding away of the female and putting on the masculine. Jane. Austen. Yeah. Jane Austen. Absolutely. <laughs> And also, you know, so they live in a cottage, right? They live in Barton Cottage. So the Dashwoods were the original cottage core, right? Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Well, ladies, thank you so much for being part of our podcast. We had so much fun with you and we wanted to invite you and come on our our show and can you tell the good people who are listening where they can find you do you want to tell them Erin I have my brain I'm having trouble (laughs) of course so we're of course on um Facebook on pop DNA um our Instagram handle is um pop DNA podcast excellent as well as our Twitter. Um, and you can listen to the show on um, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, um, anywhere else. I think, I think if, I don't think we're on Stitcher, but we're like every other podcast. No, we are. I found us. I'm oh, a Stitcher, Stitcher person. Yeah. Oh, we are. Woohoo. We finally made it. Um, and we just and... did our um, Much Ado About Nothing episode oh, just dropped, I think, yeah. today or yesterday. Yep, uh-huh. today. M- much to Do About Nothing is kind of like some, some sensibility. It was my introduction to the world of Shakespeare. So I'm Same here. Same here. <laughs> listen to your podcast about Much Ado About Nothing. The, so, the Emma Thompson Much Ado About Nothing? Yes. 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 Yes, I'm responsible for all my literary loves. <laughs> Basically, yeah. she's my hero. Yeah. Is love a fancy or a feeling? No, it is immortal as immaculate truth. It is not a blossom shed as soon as youth drops from the stem of life, for it will grow in barren regions where no waters flow, nor ray of promise cheats the pensive gloom.